I believe the one reason why the Church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the Church. We live in a world full of unbelief. We live in a world full of hostility to the Gospel, hostility and anger towards the work and person of Jesus Christ. What Christians are most comfortable with doing now, particularly here in America, is sitting in their pews doing nothing. They like to hear about the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Caucasian surfer Jesus dressed in a woman's nightgown who's standing at the door of your heart asking permission for you and your great wisdom to let him in. This is not the Jesus of the Scriptures. You've heard of the terms the Kingdom of God and synonymously the Kingdom of Heaven. But what exactly do they mean? You look around in our communities, you see homeless people living on the streets hungry without food. You see drug abuse running rampant. You see abortion clinics seemingly in every corner killing the innocent unborn at will. We continue to run away from the one and only living and true God. But what are the scriptures trying to tell us? What exactly does the kingdom of God mean? You talk a lot about like what God's intention was in putting his image in the garden. Yes. And how he puts him in it, take dominion, yes. cultivate it, and the effects of the fall. It was a desert for, before it was a garden. Okay. Because it says that uh, no water had let, yet fallen on the land. Read it. Yeah. Two. So, Genesis 2, 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. It's a desert. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And the mist was coming, going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. So now a garden's coming up. Okay. So it was a desert, there was no bushes, no water. All of a sudden God allows a mist to come on the land, and from that land He creates Eden. Okay. So from a desert, He creates a garden. And then what happens? Man sins, right? And he turns it back into a desert. Okay. <laughs> so he, well, God's purpose in putting Adam in the garden. What what is he supposed to do? It's he gets God's yeah. image yes. in the garden, and he's yes. told to do what? Work it and keep it. Okay. Dress it and keep it. Okay. As the KJV says. So his essentially he's to cultivate God's cultivation. Okay. So I think what fascinates me the most about the story of Jesus is that it doesn't drop as a novelty, right? Like in history. So like the argument of the apostles and the early Christians was not, hey, this is a really cool story. Like we like Jesus. It feels good to us. So you want to join our club. The thing that I think most draws me into this story of Jesus and history is it is not a novelty that gets dropped. It's it's something far greater. It's, it's Paul, he connects 
his explanation of the good news to God's story just continuing. Right. And so like in Romans 1, he calls it, he calls it, it God's good news. And he, he talks about Jesus who was born of a descendant of David. And he talks about, you know, which is promised in the scriptures, which is promised in the scriptures. And that, that I think is what draws me in so much. And I, I think what's, you know, for 2,000 years, mm-hmm. like that's been it, right? Like right. Christians are, you know, like the prophecies of Jesus, you know, Jesus was promised beforehand. And, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but I think that um, it, gives me, it gives me goosebumps. Like, I, I freak out, and you do too. Like, you, you know, when you hit me up with, like, a verse here or there, when you yeah. send me a text or, like, dude, check out what I read right. about Jesus and Isaiah. Right. And, um, you know, the fact that you can see all the details of Jesus in the Old Testament long before he comes. So, like, and it's not vague. You know, yeah, right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you see some, like... Um, you see some like psychic mediums or yeah. some nonsense doing some voodoo yeah. like crazy like yeah. someone in here has a throb in their knee anyone got a throb in their knee kind of thing you know yeah. and uh, that's just a ridiculous hokey you know Jedi nonsense yeah. you know um, but okay so like Jesus you know we connect to the fact that it tells you every detail about him Old Testament long before he comes his identity you know who he is where he's coming from why he's coming, when he's coming, what he's going to accomplish. So like, you know, for example, like Jesus is Messiah, but he has to fit the bill. Yeah. Right. He has to look like him. Right. And so Isaiah 9, 6, written by a monotheistic Jew, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 and, and, and moving forward, he says a, a child's going to be born, a son given to us. That's, that's all there. So you're like, okay, there's a, it's a human. But then he starts using these titles that are like elevated beyond description of any human. Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, which is the mighty God, the father of eternity. And to a monotheistic Jew, there isn't any more than one right. eternal being. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah 44:6. And so you've got the identity of the Messiah is not just a guy that's a good teacher or a prophet. He's, in fact, God. So every Jew says the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God. But it's God who's coming as a son and as a child. And, and that, that, sh- that strikes me as the most peculiar thing because you've got the exclusive nature of the Bible that separates it from every other religion. You've got one God not dependent, all-powerful, limitless in all of his attributes. He's not part of creation. He's not a part of the order itself. There's no mommy gods or daddy gods right. above him. He's, he's the one that actually speaks and everything comes into existence. And he's not like anything else. That God, that God is becoming a man to come and save his people from their sins. First thing Adam is called to do is to name the animals. It's a creative process. Right. Right. So he can name them whatever he wants, and God says that will be the name. So he has authority. Mm-hmm. Right. So he has creative authority, creative control, um, and he can he can do as he wants as an artist. And the cool thing is that in the garden were rivers, and from the rivers flew onyx, delium, and gold. And and those are not useful minerals for making hoes and axes to grow we see god already caused the plants to grow and stuff right so they're not useful in terms of making hoes and axes and pickaxes and stuff they're used for beauty right Right. so they're uh, like gold is used to adorn things you've got the when when is he coming um well he's coming in daniel 2 he's coming as a a, during the time of the fourth kingdom which if you just count down the kingdoms from from babylon yeah you've got rome and then so enter enter jesus um fourth kingdom Jesus comes in and what's Jesus and Paul and John saying John the Baptist they're saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand yeah, right. and so like they expected that the Messiah is bringing a kingdom yeah and during the time of Rome is when it's going to enter the fourth kingdom yeah. Jesus enters John enters what are they saying kingdom kingdom right. kingdom and Paul is at the end of Acts he's just talking about the kingdom with them and it was like on their lips the kingdom and I think here's the crazy thing dude I think that we're we're accustomed to talking about the story of Jesus with my, my personal salvation and your salvation, yeah. right? Like, 
That's just what we do as Christians. Right. It's about salvation. It's about forgiveness, because it is. Um, Isaiah 53, the big story of Jesus 700 years before Jesus comes. Isaiah 53 is, he's pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Um, you know, Isaiah is the dude that says, um, I'm a man of unclean lips. Right. And Isaiah 6, so he recognizes his own sin. And then he says that in Isaiah 53 that this one who's coming, he has no deceit yeah. in his mouth. And, and so there's a difference between him and even Isaiah. Right. This whole entire story is like, you know, written in, a, written in, in books, 66 different books, the whole yeah. Bible, you know, over a thousand years of composition, you know, different, you know, different time, different uh, locations, authors not even connected to each other in time and space. Right. And you've got every single one of them, like, their sin is on the page. But the crazy thing about Jesus is, you know, David's, a, David's a, the king of Israel. He's, a, he's a, an adulterer, a yeah. murderer. You know, uh, Moses doesn't get to him in the promised land because of his, of his sin. Yeah. And, um, you know, even our heroes in the New Testament, you know, Peter's sticking his foot in his mouth right. constantly. And, you know, he gets actually confronted by Paul in Galatians. But... From, from the beginning to the end of the Bible, there's one person that's identified as righteous and sinless. And that's even before Jesus comes. Mm. You know, like Christians are saying, well, Jesus is God and he's sinless. And the world today, skeptics, you know, looking, you know, their eyeball and that saying, oh, well, that's, that's, okay, that's strange. You know, what's unique about that? Well, it's totally unique even in the Bible. Yeah. Like it's not just, it's right. not just unique from world religions right. and their stories. But it's unique even in scripture that you have someone identified as righteous and blameless and without deceit and, you know, not a sinner. And that was the, what's so interesting is, so you look in the, in the Old Testament and the, the whole story of Jesus, salvation, forgiveness, who he is, when he's coming, Daniel 9 tells you he's going to come and he's going to be cut off. This is hundreds of years before Jesus comes. Yeah. He's going to be cut off and then the, the second temple is going to be destroyed. That happened. Yeah. Like, that's done. Right. 70 AD, the temple's final, des final destruction, and Jesus did come, yeah. and he was cut off before that temple was destroyed. And so that's fascinating, and I think, dude, like, the thing that excites me the most and I think settles my heart is just that, like, God controls history, and he tells us this whole story about Jesus. But we've got the part down about the salvation, forgiveness. People distort it, of course. They, yeah. they try to mess with it and screw it up. But... But we've got the story down of like Jesus comes to save me from my sins. But I think the problem we have today, like as, as a Christian community, as a culture, especially in the West, mm -hmm. is that we're missing the big part of the story. Yeah, totally. Right? It, the kingdom of God. Yeah. The fall enters. Yes. And Adam brings death. Death enters the garden. Yes. God, he's, he's God's image. Yeah. Before that, he's told in the garden to uh, be fruitful and multiply, subdue and fill the earth. Okay. Right? Right. And then after sin, there's pain in childbearing and there's a pain in the toil of the ground. Right. So it's still be fruitful and multiply with pain in childbearing and childbearing and subdue and fill the earth with pain and toil. Yeah. So that mandate is still there. It's, and, and then you see it right afterwards when it's going through the line of Cain and you see they've made bronze, they've made iron, they've made music, they've made pipe. So, so they're still taking the ground, they're still working it, they're still keeping it, they're still cultivating it. Right. So there's not a disconnect between uh, the Garden of Eden and today. It's right. the same, it's just harder. So um, non-Christian views of, of the world and spirituality that even sometimes impact Christians' thinking is is that because of the fall, like this is all this is all bad now. It's yeah, Christoplatonism. This, yeah, this this is this is bad. Heaven is good, and 100%. Let's buy the T-shirt and get the bumper sticker. Right. Heaven is great. Absolutely. Okay, but the idea is is that this is all sort of like icky. This is this is ugly, icky stuff. Yes. And we we want to get to the better spiritual stuff later and sort of escape this ugliness right and so heaven is great because that's where God dwells yeah <laughs> we were never created to be in heaven we were created to be on earth that's where we were in the, in the beginning mm -hmm. right so we say well we're gonna die and go to heaven probably for a short time until the consummation mm -hmm. but there's going to be a, a time mm -hmm. when people are risen from the dead they're judged into heaven they go into eternity mm -hmm. with God or eternity without God yeah 
and then there's the new creation the consummated earth mm -hmm. the, the the end of all things and we're still going to be where god intended us to be and god's going to walk with us and god's going to visit us so like okay so if jesus had come and not talked about the kingdom like he that wasn't his emphasis mm -hmm. if he didn't talk about like, he's the king and yeah. he's bringing a kingdom and if, if the apostles weren't saying that story that like the kingdom has arrived then, then we would just have to, every reason just to re, just reject him and just say, well, you're not the Messiah. The Messiah is the king. He's coming to bring the nations. Mm -hmm. Because we've missed the part of the story that the Old Testament doesn't just say that he's coming to save his people from their sins, mm -hmm. but that he's actually coming to bring all the nations, not just Jews, but all the nations to God. Isaiah 2, the nations are going to stream up to the mountain of God, and the law is going to go forth from Zion. Psalm chapter 2, the promise in Psalm 2 is that the, the Father's speaking to Jesus there, and he says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. So that was the, right, that's the expectation. Yeah. He's, he's not just coming to take care of my own individual salvation. Yeah. He's coming to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Jesus comes to save sinners from their sin, to reconcile the world to himself. But the first thing that the second Adam does, our representative, when he conquers death in a garden, which is where it was brought, the first thing he does is begin to work the ground. He's, he's, he's mistaken as a gardener. Right. God tells Adam, take dominion. Right. To make this beautiful. So the Old Testament is replete with references to the Messiah bringing the nations. The glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Um, you know, he's going to have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Um, like that was the story. Like it wasn't just going to be he was going to save people here and there out of the nations, but it was that all the nations were going to come to God. Yeah. Jesus is, is, according to Paul, Christian eschatology 101, 1 Corinthians 15. Mm -hmm. um, he's reigning now, yes. and he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Now that's gospel-centered, right. but everything is being put into subjection to him. Yeah. A nation who abandons God's law, there's famine, and a nation who embraces God's law. There's, there's blessings and food is abundant and there's milk and honey and, yes. and all that stuff. Yes. And so that, that's the importance of embracing God's law because it actually affects you in time and space. That's right. It blesses society. Right. Right. So When justice is, is done, when righteousness is heralded. I mean, you remember the, the vision that Daniel has in Daniel 7? Dan, Daniel 7 is amazing because Daniel 7 comes after Daniel 2 which says that God's going to set up a kingdom yeah. during the time of the, the fourth kingdom, right. and it will never be destroyed, and it won't be left to anybody else. It's just a kingdom that was going to last forever. So then in Daniel 7 now, uh, Daniel says that he has, in the night visions, he sees one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, right? And it says, really specifically, it says, he comes up to the Ancient of Days and is given a kingdom, mm -hmm. dominion. Mm -hmm. And the story there is that all people's tribes, tongues, all, they're all going to come to this Messiah because he's going to come up to the Ancient of Days. He's going to be given dominion. And lo and behold, here's Jesus. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says, after the, res after the resurrection, conquering death, dying for sins, for his people. And Daniel chapter uh, 7 moves into Dan Matthew 28 where Jesus says, all authority in heaven. And Christians go, right. Yeah. <laughs> because he's, he's the king of heaven. Right, right. But he says, and on, all of, and on earth. Yeah. So he says, all authority in heaven and on earth yeah. has been given to me. And he says, therefore, because all authority yeah. in heaven and earth has been given to him, is therefore, he says, go make disciples of all nations. all nations. And he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. obey which... It were, it were, and we're like, right, right, because that's the story. The story is, is that he gets the nations. The story is that he has dominion. The story is that God, the Father says to him, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. And, you know, we talk about this a lot, right? Yeah. Like Greg Bonson, one of the main things he used to always say when he talked about this was, do you think Jesus forgot to ask? And it's, it's obvious, right? As, right, as the nose on my face. Like, well, he ascended, he came up, to the ancient of days and he's given a kingdom that all peoples they're gonna come serve him I say all the time that our culture sees 
the great blessing in an escape. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus says in John 17, Father, I did not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Mm-hmm. And we pray in the reverse prayers. As soon as right. things get bad around us, the first thing we're saying as Christians today Rapture is, me. Father, take us out of the world, <laughs> right? right? Take us out of the world and, and leave them to the evil one. Right. The, the unbelievers. And Jesus says the meek shall inherit the earth. He takes what was the theme in Psalm 37 where, where, where it's the wicked who were uprooted from the land and the, the righteous who were left to dwell in it. And he actually expands on it now. And he says the meek shall inherit not just the land but the, the earth. Right. Paul says in Romans 4 that the, the Abraham's descendants would inherit the world. Mm-hmm. Whereas before they're thinking the land and, and Paul's like the world. Right. So, so like the the real biblical foundation of all of our thinking of the world should be this this belongs to God and His people, mm-hmm. right? Right. And Christ's gospel redeems sinners, and this world's going to be filled with descendants of Abraham as as numerous as the stars. And you know what? And it's it's interesting because when Jesus comes in Matthew four, after the testing in the wilderness. Now think about this for a second. We talked about this, this this Sunday, right, at church. So Isaiah 2 says that in the last days, the story goes, uh, let me get to it here, Isaiah 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains um, and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law. Okay, so so that's the background. Right. Satan comes to Jesus, last testing, yeah. right? And he brings him up where? To a great and high mountain. And what is he showing Jesus? He's showing the Messiah, all the kingdoms yeah. of the world. And he, he says this, look, I'll give, you, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Yeah. And he says, all you gotta do is just one thing. I'll give you the ultimate you came for. Yeah. You give me the ultimate, you, your worship. Yeah. And Jesus says, you should worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. But I think it's interesting that what does Satan give as in Matthew, the final testing of Jesus? Exactly what he came for. Yeah. Yeah. He goes to a high mountain. Yeah. Isaiah 2. Without any. Right. And he says, all right, I'll give him to you. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Why would that be in, in any sense a temptation to Jesus at all? And also because he's the Messiah. Yeah. And he came for the whole world, all the nations. Yeah. And, and it can't be an accident that here Satan brings him to this great and high mountain to show him the kingdoms of the world. Because here's Isaiah 2 and, and yeah. the whole background. And by the way, Matthew thinks in Isaiah so much. You, my, Isaiah is in the back of Matthew's mind. So here's Satan bringing Jesus to a great high mountain. He says, okay, there's all the kingdoms. I'll give you now. Go ahead and just worship me. But it's amazing because as soon as Jesus defeats Satan in that temptation... In Matthew 4, Jesus comes out and it says, Matthew says that he, he is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. kingdom. And it's amazing because I think what, what we've neglected in our culture is just that. That it's not just about, about my own private salvation before God, Jesus redeeming me. He's, he's got a whole story of history where he is actually bringing the nations. I mean, like, like what if, what if, what if the Great Commission isn't wishful thinking? What if it's the story? What if it's actually the nations? What if it's actually everybody, actually discipled, taught to obey, saved, forgiven, yes, reconciled to God through faith and without works of law? But what if it's the nations? What if that's the end goal? Often what we try to do is we try to bring people into our church to bring them into salvation. Uh, But the reality is many people won't ever make that step. And so what happens to all these people who won't make that step? They're gonna be lost. And you know, like, like what if the timeline that Paul has in 1 Corinthians 15, what if that's actually the timeline, right? Like what if that's it? Like today in our culture, what, what's, the, what's, what's the big thing right now? Like it's in the theaters is, is the, Le- the Left Behind right. series, right? Yeah. It's an eschatological view that is about 200 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, a secret rapture, seven years of tribulation, you know, and then Jesus comes to establish right. his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Okay. No, not yet. Yeah, so, and, and it's so funny, it's what we'll say typically, and I used to be someone that believed this, is to say, well, he is, he is a king now, but yeah. not yet, right. fully, because it's coming later. But what it ends up being, really, 
is not now but not yet, but now but not really. Yeah. Right. Yeah, sort of. Now, yeah, now but not really. Because yeah. later. But like, what if Paul's timeline is true? Like, what if the popular view today in the West is actually doing damage to us when we say that Jesus isn't really king now with all authority in heaven and on earth? On earth? Yeah. And what if, we're, what if we haven't seen the goal and the vision truly is the nations all discipled? It's not wishful thinking. That's what Jesus is going to get. Um, he has dominion, all authority. He's getting them. The glory of God's going to fill the earth and all the nations are going to stream up. Like, what if that's the story? What if it's not defeat in history? What, what if it's not that we're, we're supposed to be waiting for a secret rapture that pulls us out of the world to just leave it to burn in hell? Yeah. What if Jesus is right when he says in John 17 in his prayer, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You know, what if, what if Jesus means for us to pray the Lord's Prayer and actually mean it when he says in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, yeah. your will be done on earth right. as it is in heaven. What if, what if Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, the meek shall inherit the earth. What if he meant that? Right? <laughs> like that's, that's true. Yeah. I think it's important that the church isn't just a blessing to those who attend, but it's also a blessing to those who need to know the Lord and also a blessing to the community around them so that it becomes a focal point within any community and a place for people to understand that if we need help, this is where we can go. And so it's our job, it's, it's our commission, right, by Jesus is to go out and to make disciples. I mean, what are we making disciples for if it's not actually to expand the kingdom of heaven? What if Paul's timeline in 1 Corinthians 15 is in fact the timeline that he, he, he pulls from Psalm 110.1. It's quoted often in the New Testament where in Psalm 110 it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Right. Well, is Jesus at the right hand of the Father? Yes. Yeah. Is he seated now? Yeah. Yes. And so Paul says, okay, so this is the timeline. Jesus is raised. He's the first fruits of those, you know, who'll be raised. And he says that right now he is putting his enemies under his feet, making him a footstool for his feet. Well, that's Psalm 110. 1. And then Paul says that Jesus is seated, reigning, putting his enemies under his feet. And he says the last enemy to be defeated is death. So in Paul's timeline, you've got Jesus is king. He's seated. He's reigning. He's putting his enemies under his feet. And then after all enemies are put under his feet, then, then, after that's done, then Jesus delivers the kingdom over to the Father. Not he comes to bring it. Yeah. He comes, yeah, he, he, he consummates yeah. it. He gives it to the Father as a done deal. And so what if that's the story? Yeah. What, what, if, what if we're not supposed to be as Christians just dreaming about getting snatched away? But, but what, if, what if actually God's call for us is to actually invest ourselves in this world and the lives of others with the good news of the kingdom, its salvation, forgiveness, reconciliation, peace with God. But there's a whole other part of the story that it's, it's the whole world. It's all the nations. It's, it's not just me. And, and, and what if we're not supposed to see cultural decay as a good thing? Now Jesus said in Matthew 16 18, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Well, what do gates do? What do you walk up to a gate? What do you do? Run? The gate's after me. And you run away? The gates don't do anything. They are there for us to knock down. And the only way we can knock down the gates of hell is if we are out there knocking on those gates and kicking those gates down. But we have to do it with truth. We can't do it if we're pacified through our comfort in our technology and in our churches and we go to the church and we feel comfortable the whole time. We get this nice message and then we go out afterwards and we go to a nice restaurant where we're served. This is is not what Christianity is supposed to be. I used to think, um, so I used to think like, every bad event I ever saw was like the greatest right. news yeah. ever. Because my thought was, um, okay, this means that at any moment, mm -hmm. I'm getting taken out. And I can remember distinctly looking at newspapers specifically for events that I thought 
yeah. might be the signal yeah. that at any moment I'm getting taken out of here. And you know, I, so it's amazing, when I come from that background, I sympathize with the thinking. Oh yeah. You know, I was excited. Yeah. Honestly, it's sick, isn't it? I mean, it's like, yeah. I was excited about cultural decay because in my mind it just meant that I get to go, right? And that Jesus will come back and he'll take care of all of this, but I, I, get, I get out. And it's amazing as you look at the Bible and you look at the early church, you look at what they were proclaiming, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, and the aim was all the nations and disciple them, not just get some people out of the nations, yeah. but actually disciple them. You know, you start thinking, well, this story is different, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Because, because like, what if, what if we're not supposed to see that decay as good? Like, what if, what if we're supposed to actually be praying that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven? And, and that the actual, the actual mechanism for that, that fulfills the Lord's Prayer, is the proclamation of repentance and faith yeah. to the world. And it's, and it's bold, and it's sacrificial, and, it's, and it invests itself. Like, what if we're supposed to not be dreaming of just getting zapped out of our shoes, but we're actually supposed to be thinking about leaving a legacy for the kingdom right. of Christ in right. the world? Think, think about the, the word kingdom. We get twisted up as Christians today. Like we try to think of like, like we're like um, the, the building stuff. Like yeah. where's, where's, the, where's it at? And that's what the Jews were thinking. Yeah, right. Because so, yeah. they say to Jesus, they're like, where, you know, where is it? Yeah. And he says, don't think you'll be able to say, see here or see there, yeah. for it's within you. Yeah. And he tells them that he brought it when they accused him of working with Satan. So if you turn down to Matthew 12, Christ is casting out demons, and the Pharisees accuse him of casting out those demons by Beelzebul. And Christ's response is, if I cast out these demons in the Spirit of God, then the Kingdom of God has come upon you. So this is a critical passage, because really only one of three things can be true. Well, the answer is yes, he did. So it came upon them. And he told them in Matthew um, that some of them wouldn't die until they saw it come with power, the Kingdom. And so it's clear. They, it, was, it, was, it was the now and not yet part, I think, is there. Because yeah. it's just, it's coming into history, but Jesus yeah. had stuff to do. Right. And it broke into history. And, and it means right. not, it's a building, it's a place, it's, a, it's, a, it's an army over there, but it's his rule. So they were looking for the rule of God in history, the rule of the Messiah in history. And how does his rule start? With me. Right. right. With you. Yeah. And as, as people come in repentance and faith right. to Christ, they're brought under his rule. Right. They're brought into his kingdom. And, and Paul says just as much. He says he delivered us out of the domain of darkness and he's brought us into the kingdom of his son, right? In, Ro in Revelation 1, John says he's made us a kingdom, priests to God. And so, okay, so what if the story is not we're waiting for Jesus to come and, and drop a kingdom to obliterate history? What if he is king of kings now? What if he does have all authority in heaven and earth now? What if he was ascended and seated and, as Daniel says, given a kingdom and dominion which would never be destroyed? What if the story is actually true that the Bible tells? Yeah. What if the timeline yeah. is exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15? He's reigning now, putting his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is death after everything is under his feet. And then the kingdom is delivered over to the Father after everything's brought into subjection to Jesus. What if, what if the, one of the main things that's doing damage to us right now, dude, there's a host of things, yeah. okay? But like, what if one of the main things is our view of the future? That quote from Douglas Wilson that I've said to you before, where he said on, we did a radio show with him and he said, um, you hit what you aim at, right? What if us thinking that checking out is better? What if us thinking that he doesn't really have all authority? What if us dreaming about getting zapped about, out of our shoes has brought us to a, a place as a church as his kingdom in the world? Yeah of impotence, yeah. that we, we don't do anything because we think it's a good thing when the world goes to hell. What if, what if our thinking that the kingdom comes later, 
not so much now, has actually been destructive to our proclamation of the good news. Oh, yeah. My experience with opiates was, um, I knew that that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Just one more hit, one more sip. One more line, just one more time. I know I said that last time, but this the last time. True, I know I said the last time too. I'm sick of these last time lines. If I had a dollar for them, man, I probably could afford a trip to the Hamptons. No, I'm going overboard, rock bottom anchor. Do I even know the Lord? Look at my anger, look at my desires, and I'm prone to cover what's resting on tires. Known for self reliance. Look at my defiance. Am I hopeless? It's hard. Living in a city oversaturated with pleasures Full of self-indulgence, make you feel better Many ways to travel away from reality You're welcome to stay, but I don't see nothing here for me High school is when I started dabbling in drugs and alcohol, and uh, I knew instantly, instant peace. Um, what what was it? What was it first? So uh, weed and okay. alcohol, and there was no really consequences in my life at that point. I was still able to maintain um, that I was okay. I was able to maintain um, that I could hold it all together, that I could do this. Um, and eventually, the pressure of what was going on at home, um, it became too much. Okay, like for example, like think about like what we're talking about, like the optimistic view of the kingdom of God in history, that Christ is the king, he brought the kingdom, you know, and that he's going to have victory over the nations. Like that was the predominant view in America not very long ago. And what kind of fruit was brought out of that? Well, a lot of fruits. Yeah. I mean, missions movements. Um, the judiciary reflected the laws of God in many respects. Um, in some places on the north, uh, uh, the eastern coast, you you had to be a baptized Trinitarian Christian to run for political office. Yeah, she's <laughs> yeah. crazy, right? And um, and, and look at the fruit. Uh, liberty. It was on everyone's lips. Liberty. You know, freedom. Yeah. Um, so, people were unique in God's yeah. eyes. Um, so the fruit of that, of, of an optimistic view of the kingdom of Christ, like, it, it actually had fruit to it. So you begin to see in history, like, another view kind of creeps into the minds of Christians, and that's that um, oh, he's bringing the kingdom later, and we're going to get zapped out of here, and the worse it gets for our, the world, the better it is for us, because it means we're, 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 we're getting, oh, fly away, right, you know? Um, and that, what if that has caused us? To, to be indifferent? What if it's caused us to be impotent? What, and what if it's the answer, one of the answers, to the cultural decay around us? Because Je Jesus told us, he said, you're the salt, and salt preserves. Right. You're the light of the world. And, and what if our saltiness and our light is diminished as a result of a bad view of the future? Yeah. And a, and a totally unbiblical view of the kingdom of God. Um, and what if, what if that has been the cause to the decay around us? At least one of the causes. Yeah. Too many Christians, what they want to do is sit and say, no, somebody else is to do that, not me. The pastor is to do that, not me. That evangelist over there that I give $5 a month to, uh, living in a hard life and a hard situation in another country, he's supposed to or she's supposed to do that kind of a work. Me, I go take care of my job. I go take care of my family. I watch sports on the weekend and maybe sometime I might tithe because I don't want to be inconvenienced. This is the sad attitude that is prevalent in the Christian church and it needs to be changed. And, and what if, what would, what would happen? I always try to think through, like, what would it be like if Christians believed like the early church? Christ is king, he's seated, reigning. Enemies are under his feet. That's where we're going. His enemies are going under his feet. All the nations are coming. What would happen if we believed that and started living like it? Yeah and serving God like that? What if we started leaving legacies for the gospel instead of only thinking five years ahead? Yeah. Like I remember, dude, um, 
okay, so like the turn of the, the, the century, 2000, there were so many prophecy books oh. that came out. I'm talking like Hal Lindsey and, you know, all these prophecy pundits and, you know, guys that constantly pumping out, you know, paper and, you know, speculation. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I can remember, dude, I remember reading in one of these books from one of these famous prophecy writers. He was talking about, I don't plan on making any, any plans for New Year's because I don't plan to be here. That's what I mean, the short-sightedness of it, is that you're not investing your life for the, good, the gospel of the kingdom because you're not thinking more than two years ahead, three years ahead, five years ahead. We're not to put anything before God. We're to put Him before all other things. Too many Christians don't realize that Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. And he said, do this daily, follow me. To pick up that cross is a difficult thing to do. It means that we have to be uncomfortable. If you think in your Christian life that maybe you are too comfortable, well, that's good. Maybe you are too comfortable. But maybe you think you need to get more creature comforts. And that's okay too. But what about the issue of preaching the gospel? What about the issue of expanding the kingdom of God? Why did God save you? Did he save you to make you comfortable? Did he save you to increase your bank account? Did he save you to show how much he loves you? Well, he saved you, not so that you could become some polished trophy on a shelf set up there so that you can just be admired. No. Think of yourselves as sneakers. Sneakers aren't always the best looking thing and you put them on they're kind of comfortable sometimes and you walk around and you traipse around the landscape and they go everywhere and they get a little bruised up and a little used but they're being used sometimes christians they don't want that what they want is to be that trophy because they look at themselves as being the object of love instead of understanding that true love is other centered god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. We're so familiar with John 3.16, but we don't realize that it's other-centeredness that God has called us to. The other-centeredness of expanding the kingdom of God by preaching the gospel, which in the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that Jesus said, go preach that gospel, make disciples of every nation. That's what we're called to do. It's okay to be comfortable, but when comfort undermines the preaching of the gospel, when your comfort undermines the expansion of the kingdom of God, when your comfort undermines your desire to bring glory to the Lord God, then you've become an idolater in that area. And you need to break those idols and get rid of them. I remember being in Bible college, believing this, yeah. and going to lunch. Actually, I think going to coffee here. <laughs> this is like, it was like 18 years ago? Yeah. And I think I, remember, I think I remember sitting here with guys from Bible college. We were being taught this view. And I remember being in here, and I remember we were, we were thinking, how long do you think we have to go? Five years? And I, and I think someone mentioned maybe 20, and everyone scoffed. They were like, oh, you, don't, you haven't been doing your homework. You don't know about the red heifer that they have. You don't know about the cornerstone they have ready to lay for that temple in Jerusalem. You, know, you, don't, you don't even know, man, not 20 years? I'm like, two Two at the most, yeah. man. It can't go any yeah. farther than two. And that's the point. Yeah. Like, if, if you think that, you can't say that it doesn't affect what you live. And so after high school, you know, I, uh, just the amount of pain that I experienced growing up um, was so great and, uh, I eventually started doing opiates, pills, and um, it was kind of like a weekend thing, and uh, eventually uh, the amount increased, and um, <clears throat> my experience with opiates was, um, I knew that that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life, right when I experienced that, because okay. of the euphoric feeling from that. I was ready to give my soul up for this, this drug. Yeah. This this was everything to me. This was my God. This is what I worshipped. Um, and it didn't matter what I had to do. Whether that was like selling drugs, uh, selling myself. Um, no human power was going to be able to stop me right. from doing that. And so you mentioned worship like it's everything. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the whole context real fast. Like, how are you worshipping 
a guy? How are you worshiping pornography? How are you worshiping heroin? Mm -hmm. And the wor worship is is glory in something and sacrificing to it. Mm -hmm. And so that heroin takes the weight of your life. Mm -hmm. It has the glory. Mm -hmm. And you sacrifice everything to it. Mm -hmm. Those are things Christians do in church. Yeah. That's what they do in worship. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you sacrificed everything for this. Everything. So what, what happened? So, you know, I continued to use heroin, be and I started to realize that I couldn't stop. That I had no, there was no power in me. Even in moments where um, I'd wake up in the morning sick, asking myself, why do I keep doing this? Why can I stop? Going into, you know, St. Luke's detox, getting physically off of the drug, going back out, and still not being able to stop. No matter uh, the pain, the destruction that was causing in my family, um, I couldn't stop, no matter what. How did I come to know the Lord? Um, that was a very lengthy process. I spent a lot of years in gangs um, in the streets of San Diego, California. Joined the, the gang in the neighborhood that I grew up in and spent a lot of time just doing what you know, what, what you shouldn't be doing and uh, get into a lot of trouble. I ended up getting into some trouble in, in here in New Mexico. When I came down here, moved down here, I picked up a, a robbery charge just trying to f just trying to keep my my addiction fed. I robbed a, I robbed a, 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 a place of business and um, got in trouble for it and I got nine years. And eventually uh, there came a point where um, I woke up one morning, and it was just like every single morning. I wake up, getting ready, having to put on this face, because at the time I didn't have a job. So all my drugs had to come from a drug dealer. And um, free, and no money. So having to do whatever I had to do to get. Mm -hmm. And the guilt and the shame from that was so intense. Mm -hmm. um, I remember looking at myself in the mirror in my bathroom and I just emptiness mm. saw nothing there whenever I joined the the street gang in California I had no idea that it was as far reaching as out here I got to prison new guy I was approached by some some other people from California and they basically told me listen we're your family we're here for you and you're here for us I was brought into a basically the New Mexico chapter of a, of a very huge mix, a very very huge prison gang, uh, and so I did my time serving their needs. Uh, I became an enforcer. Uh, I became a collector and an organizer, and uh, basically took care of business for a group of men that I used to call my brothers. And as I'm sitting in that bathroom, my mom calls me. And at, now I look back and it was totally gone. I picked up the phone and she goes, are you okay? Because at that point I was, they thought that I was, um, you know, clean, going to AA meetings, you know, I was just hiding everything. And I said, no, I need help. And if I don't get help right now, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Because there was only a small window that I knew to get me into a safe place because, you know, heroin wanted to kill me. I know that was the ultimate death from worshiping that idol. And I knew death was coming and I couldn't stop it. Right. I, I needed something much greater than me to intervene. And so I remember uh, my mom coming home to pick me up and as she, she's driving home, I have enough to definitely overdose in my bathroom. And so this is my last time. And, I, and there was no thought of God, no thought of prayer, nothing. Because at that point, God was non-existent in my life. There was no such thing as a God. And I remember sitting in that bathroom and I said, this is it. This is the last time. And all of a sudden, I just threw it all down the bathtub. And right then and there, it, it was, that's when God started intervening. And um, I eventually made it to a drug and alcohol treatment center. And I wasn't, at that point, I wasn't seeking after God. I didn't know who God was. I was just completely 
broken on my knees, willing to do anything at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, I went into prison addicted to heroin and came out with with a worse addiction than I went in with. So I, I, I came out and I, I, I was just doing what I, what I knew what to do. I hustled and I, and I robbed and, and, uh, and uh, kept feeding my addiction. I ended up back in prison and served what would amount to 13 years. So for 13 years I, I shed blood for a group of men, a prison gang. Around the end of my 13th year, I was set to uh, take care of somebody. I was, I was, I was given a, 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 a piece of paper with somebody's name on it and, and he needed to be dealt with. This gentleman, he screamed and cried out for his life and, and he cried like with tears and begged me not to hurt him. And then I stopped and I let him go. And I knew that when I let him go, that that was like my own death sentence in a matter of speaking. But I couldn't do it. I remember um, seeing the chapel room and so I'm still sick, very, very sick. And I end up going into the chapel room and I hear the message for the first time. And what's interesting is I remember leaving that chapel room, not feeling free, not feeling like peace feeling anger yeah. is what I was feeling and what I really think that is was fear because I was starting to experience the depravity of, of what was going on in my You started life. to see yourself mm -hmm. for who you were. Yeah. You started getting a clearer mm -hmm. picture of who God yeah. is. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't push that pain. It was just kept coming up and I was trying to push it down and it kept coming up. Everything. I was seeing everything as it is. Um, God was drawing all these things out of me. and. Uh, so you hear the gospel, and you leave actually angry mm -hmm. at a chapel that night. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I uh, remember that night going back to my bed, tossing and turning, um, and it was around you know two, three in the morning. And I remember laying there in my detox bed, and uh, this was my first communication with God. I. I remember laying there and I didn't know who God was. I didn't even know what, how do you pray? What do you do say? I just remember like, all I said was God, like I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't keep living this way anymore. Like you just take me, take all of me. Mm -hmm. And um, that when, you know, I was saved, it was that moment laying in my bed sick, completely broken, and nothing, and um, I just completely gave my life away. And that next morning, I denied all medication and no detox symptoms. You know, I was the amount that I was using, there was no way that four days in detox was enough to be free from um, just the physical pain that, that um, you experience. And that's when the transformation started. Before that day, I kind of, I had already started to have like these, what I could call like tugs at my heart, where I was starting to think a bit about what I was involved in. The violence and like, uh, you know, the bloodshed and, 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 and uh, the lying and the manipulation and all those things that I was taught to do to, to keep myself alive and, 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 and living good in a place like prison, I was counted on to do those things. I was required to do those things. And I started finding that I couldn't do those things anymore. I remember when I was in there, for 30 days, just me and the Lord and His Word, I remember thinking like, this is, this is not just for me. This, I have to, I ha and I have to tell this to people. And I remember even the girls in there, I'm one week walking with God, and I'm telling them about Jesus. You gotta go to chapel. You gotta hear this message. Let's let's do a Bible study. That you guys gotta hear this. This is crazy. Like God saved me. Mm -hmm. Like I'm free. I have no obsession to use. Like He's like you put to death immediately a desire to use. Mm -hmm. He's continu He's immediately putting 
to death, bringing up my sin, causing me to hate it, and just a week with walking with him. Yeah. Our condition, we're sinners, God is holy, and I talked a lot in chapel about that this is not so much of a, of a drug and alcohol problem, this is an, an addiction disease problem, it's, it's a problem of, of worship. You're worshiping this in place of God, and that is our default position, mm -hmm. is fallen people is to manufacture idols, mm -hmm. and we're constantly doing it. And so, in a fallen state, we're always pursuing idols and we love them, because we don't want God. Mm -hmm. And so you come to a place where God is, and His grace ordered your steps to where you can hear His word and His truth, and you're in your darkest, most broken mm -hmm. place. And you get overwhelmed with a sense. You told me before you just were overwhelmed with a sense of your guilt, mm -hmm. and then you turn to Christ. Yeah. So your heart transforms, and now it's not so much that you became a good girl, yeah. and you you really you do, you're doing just a great job of mm -hmm. you know coping with something, mm -hmm. but that God has transformed you from the inside. Your heart's transformed, and He's caused you to desire to worship Him above something else. And it doesn't mean you're perfect. Yeah. It means that now your desire is to love God and pursue Him. Because of the suffering, like the suffering that I experience in my addiction is not wasted. Right. God did not waste that. Mm -hmm. Even though I was in sin, like He redeemed me out of that. Like that was His sovereign will for me to experience that suffering. And then now I have, because of that, I'm able to comfort those who are now suffering from that. Like we are, we are called to go speak to those who are also suffering from addiction. It was in prison that I came to know who Christ was. You know, people ask me what it is to be the light and salt. And to be the light is just to bring God's truth to the dark places. And the salt is to preserve His word, preserve His truth. And one of those dark places that so desperately needs it is a place like the abortion mill, a place like Planned Parenthood. So when we're out at the abortion mill, what we're trying to do, uh, kind of thinking of three things I want to do. I want to tell them about the help available to them. There's all types of help. These are all uh, uh, God's children that, uh, uh, they, they, the children are our future. They are, you know, next generation. They are our grandchildren. And we tell them about the precious baby in the womb. We'll show them the baby model. Uh, this is a baby girl at 12 weeks. And one of the reasons I feel so led to go there is I was one of those girls years ago before I got married, before I had my own two children in that marriage. I was a girl that walked through those doors and I didn't walk through those doors once. I walked through those doors a second time and I was about to walk through those doors a third time and I miscarried. And God had me see what it was I was doing. He got a hold of my heart that day, and he showed me that it wasn't a lump of cells. It wasn't a choice. There was no freedom in this. He was so gracious to get a hold of me that day and say, stop. For all the Christians that if you see somebody uh, hungry, you should feed them. You see somebody without clothing, you should uh, take your shirt off your, 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 off yourself, you know, that uh, now you see they are killing our uh, younger generations, you know, how can I stand, uh, stay home and do nothing, you know? This is the least I can do. I walked through those doors because I was the girl that was made fun of in high school and I wanted to be loved, I wanted to be liked, I wanted people to think I was pretty. And so I lived the wrong way. I went, I went to where I thought love was, where, you know, I could find somebody telling me that I was good enough, somebody that telling me I was pretty enough, somebody filling my heart, my soul, and really what I was doing is I was just emptying it. I wasn't filling it up. And so I have to go to the abortion mill. I have to tell these girls what people aren't telling them. I have to tell them. I have to tell them that what you're about to do is going to be a road that will just tear you apart. There's no freedom in that choice. And so knowing this, if I would keep that to myself after God so graciously got a hold of me, and I would do nothing, that's not being the light. That's not being salt. And people tell me, well, Rebecca, you know, you're going to be hated for it. You know, you might be hurt for it. So what? So what? 
I have a God that is so gracious and he saved a wretch like me. And if I keep that to myself for fear of being hurt and don't take that into the world, then it's all for nothing. And then we preach the law and the gospel to them. You know, if they turn to Jesus Christ, they would never even think of killing their baby. So we're out here for lives, for souls, and most of all, we're out here for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let your baby live! Please! Let your baby live! So, so we think about some foundational things. Christ has risen from the dead, the second Adam. He's conquered our sin. He's washed it away. Mm -hmm. He's redeeming sinners. He's bringing his salvation to the ends of the earth. And nations are going to flow up to the mountain of God. And, and um, he has dominion, mm -hmm. glory, and a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Mm -hmm. and, and he is actively right now putting things in subjection to himself. First, he saves sinners. Mm -hmm. But we're supposed to care yes. about here and now. Right. Because he has authority in heaven and on earth. This is his. It doesn't belong to the devil. Right. And so Christians have sort of like handed off the culture, the world around yeah. them, to the unbelievers. Because here's the thing. We want to go home. Right. And, but the truth is, is Jesus owns all this. Right. So when we sit there and say, it's going to hell in a handbasket, just, you know, prepare the way, you know, for destruction. Right. Like, could you imagine? Like, Jesus, he's Here. like, this is, this is what God gave me as a gift. Yes. You know, and your attitude is to just let it go to hell? Yeah. You no. Know, like, right. that's got to be offensive to God. Yeah. Who's sitting at the right hand, ruling and reigning with power, and he's making enemies his feet. Jesus ushered in the kingdom in the first century with his first coming. Uh, his, his ascension to the right hand of God uh, marks the beginning of his session as, as king of, of heaven and earth. It's a, it is a progressive growth. Uh, Christ likens it to a mustard seed and, and leaven. Uh, so it's, as, this is something, mustard tree does, doesn't grow instant, instantaneously. It takes time. It's, it's, a, it's almost unobservable even. Um, but it is effective and it will grow to be larger than all the other garden plants. So we have confidence in the words of Christ that his kingdom uh, will fill the whole earth as it says in Daniel 2. Even in light of that, it's not, it's not going to be easy. I mean, Paul said we must enter the kingdom of God with much persecution. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of struggle. It's a battle. Um, but that does not preclude victory um, at the end for us. What kind of gospel are we proclaiming? Yeah if we're not teaching people the whole story yeah. that Jesus has all authority and that he's in charge. He's the king. Yeah. Right? What's Paul? He goes into Athens and he's not like, hey, y'all want to try <laughs> Jesus out? Like, you know, y'all y'all want to give him a chance? Like, yeah. you know, uh, the happy message of the day. He actually says basically, um, like, you know the God that I'm talking about and he's raised Jesus from the dead and he commands men everywhere to repent. He's not saying like, would you give Jesus a chance? Would you yeah. try him out? You know, yeah. add him to your story. He says, God commands you to repent and to believe ultimately is the, is the story. Forgiveness, salvation, God commands you to repent. We do not accomplish his will by sitting and doing nothing. Go out and take risks. Don't worry about making mistakes, but be changed. Ask Jesus to change you in your heart. Ask him to work in your heart, to equip you, to change you, to send you, and to go. And don't worry about making mistakes because we all make mistakes as we seek to accomplish the expansion of the kingdom of God for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But know this, the reason we exist is not for our comfort, not for our redemption, but it is for the glory of God. And God himself said in Isaiah 43, 7, he said, I made you for my glory. That's why we're here. How are you living for the glory of God? Are you living for the glory of God by going out to a restaurant after church and you have a nice meal and you consider maybe tipping or you might tie that day or not? Or are you concerned about the work of God in the hearts of people who are on their way to hell? I'm Jeremy Neely. And I'm Casey Neely. We're a husband and wife duo based out of Nashville, Tennessee called Neely. Our mission is to reclaim the arts for the glory of God. Uh, our piece is music. We see God as our record label, our manager, our agent, if you will. And, uh, and we just roll with it 
you know, we're, we're small and so we can just move quickly however the Lord leads and whatever doors that He opens up for us, we can just, we can just go there, whether that be um, serving a community through a church or even just rolling in and building um, relationships at a, at a little club or something that likes to do live music. Jesus has authority in every area, including beautification including yes. arts yes okay so talk about that v very much so <laughs> like that is adam's first job right right there was gold delium and onyx that was flowing into the river to beautify the garden yeah gold we know what gold is for so it could be used as a currency of course but it's also used to beautify stuff beautify uh, other things Delium is used for incense and for sweet aromas and anointing oils and then onyx is of course used for beauty yeah. So then you get to the temple in Exodus where God commands all these artists to bring their gifts and their talents by the way uh, Their gifts and their talents were learned in Egypt for 400 years mm. pagans make uh, uh, Great art with poor theology and Christians make poor art with Great, great theology. Mm -hmm. Right, so we've conflicted that and haven't tried to do. And that it both. wasn't always that way. No. The history of the Christian Church. We we were the, the culture makers. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, in the Renaissance, the church was buying the art. It was humanist art mm -hmm. because the church was humanist. Mm -hmm. But they were still making great art. They were buying great art, and then you have the Reformation art, which you have Rembrandt. Uh, who made these fantastic paintings that he got down to the detail of the reflection of the the eye duck, the, the tear duck. Yes. You can see in the paintings and yes. stuff. And so that's just a, a level of art that we just don't see anymore. We throw splatter paint up against the wall and we're like, yay. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, yeah. or, or pornography. Right. right? So Which is the art of our culture. Right. We look at the letters that Paul wrote to the early churches and um, and you know, we see this reoccurring theme throughout them it's always pointing back to the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, be imitators of Christ, live the life of Christ, etc., etc. And it's a, it's a reoccurring theme, and that's always the focal point of the letters as well. And so, you know, that's where we see the disconnect in, in today's church, you know, is that, uh, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on, on the cradle and the grave, but we really kind of leave out this three and a half years of Jesus living in front of us, showing us how to live and how God intended for us to live. You know, this is wild. Okay, so the early church in the book of Acts, um, there's a charge brought against the Christians where the charge is, is that they say there's another king, Jesus. Yeah. And my fear is that today in the West, mm. as Christians, we can almost never get charged with that. Yeah. That we would actually say, yeah. before governing authorities, that there's another king, Jesus. You're not it. He's, he has authority over you. The early church was actually charged with that. That they're saying there's another king, yeah. Jesus. And my fear is that it is, is, a, is a wrong view of the kingdom of God and what God is doing in history has led us to a place that I fear that as Christians today, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be accused of that. So the foundation to all of what we're talking about is, is the good news of what God has done in Christ to save sinners. In and like, time. we're supposed to bring that, that message of His authority, yes. His Lordship, and His redemption to every single nook and cranny. People go, like, to my neighbor, we go, yes and amen. Like, to my dad who's not a believer, yes and amen. Right. Like, to my school, yes and amen. To, to the local government, yes and amen. To the arts and media, mm -hmm. Yes, yes and amen. amen. And science, yes and amen. Like everywhere we put, say, look, we need to bring the gospel to this area and the authority of Christ to this area and do it better, make it beautiful, turn this wilderness right. into a garden. Right. When you uh, walk into this world, you almost act as though there's realms that are actually not under Jesus' authority. Exactly. You know, like, you know, when we go out and do a ministry to the abortion mills, like we're going out there and we're saying, Jesus has authority over this. Yeah and he's gonna put this under his feet. Right. And so, you know, almost 40 babies saved from death right. at abortion mills, as a result of what? Going to proclaim repentance and faith to people at that mill and offering help and love and support. But also we recognize that Jesus is, has authority over this right yeah, now. And, um, and so it begins to affect what you do in the world. And you know, even, how about this, even raising kids. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I, we're raising our kids with an actual catechism. Right. This is who God is. 
this is what his word says, this is what we believe, and you, you begin to raise your kids with a whole different view of their future. Yeah. We're definitely broken vessels, and, and as I think about the word broken, you know, it, it kind of has two meanings whenever you're serving in ministry, because, you know, obviously um, we're broken vessels from the fact that um, we brought sexual impurity into our marriage. We brought all kinds of baggage in that, that manner. Um, for many years, I struggled with alcohol and drug addiction. And, um, you know, you're just that guy. You're that girl. And you, you, feel, you feel like you're less than worthy to be able to do something for the service of the King of Kings, you know? This right here is one of my favorite things that I own. It is a, an authentic wine goblet from around 330 BC in southern Italy, give or take 10 years. This is authentic. Now, I like it. It's missing some pieces. It is essentially a broken vessel. I'm a broken vessel. You are a broken vessel. In the hand of the master, the broken vessel can be used for mighty things. You need to have confidence in God's ability in you. Don't undermine that with thinking that you're not good enough, you're not able enough. You're good enough and you're able enough in the areas that God has equipped you. What you need to do is trust Him in His ability to work with you, to take you, to put you into His hand and put you where He wants you to be. He'll admire His workmanship in you. What you need to do is be available. Trust God and go. Trust Him and yield and ask to be used. And you will be surprised what He can do with yet another broken vessel. And if God is wounding us as a Christian, mm -hmm. He's wounding us to heal us. Mm -hmm. He's exposing this place within us mm -hmm. because that's what's broken mm -hmm. and He's showing it to us. And it hurts. Yeah. And God takes us from that domain of darkness and brings us into the rule of His Son and promises not to leave us as he got us. Mm -hmm. You're an example. Mm -hmm. You're a trophy of God's faithfulness mm -hmm. where he shows the world in you. Mm -hmm. He showed the world that though she seemed hopeless and a mess and broken, watch what I do with her. And then the other side of broken, the broken vessel, the, the word broken that I've really thought about is that um, you know, somewhere along the way, my my will, my kingdom, had to be broken. You know, and uh, we had to we had to break our will to to live out for the King of Kings. When God entered in my life, it wasn't like He was done. Right. He immediately started working, and the people, the closest people in my life, my family members, it was like throwing a pebble into the lake. And watching the ripples just your family's transformed yeah now it's in Christ I'm worshiping God next to my father who I've watched use drugs and alcohol my whole life we are together worshiping Christ so Jesus brings his rule and salvation his victory mm -hmm. into your life and then that kingdom now expands from mustard seed to large tree mm -hmm. which is God's pattern yeah. mustard seed to tree so you're the little seed mm -hmm. and then that tree begins to expand and now it's transforming the people all around you in your lives yeah. in your life daily mm -hmm. as you bring the good news of salvation and forgiveness as a gift through faith in Jesus to the world around you so do you do you believe that Jesus rules over the area of addictions absolutely he's ruling and reigning right now so the big the big picture we should have as Christians is that Jesus is king and that's a meaningful statement Mm -hmm. It's not just a punchline at a party. Mm -hmm. He's king. Yes. And that, and that his, his authority, his kingship is over every area. And so we ought not to see an area of the world, art, science, media, whatever, as, well, we can't touch that. We right. can't beautify it for Jesus. Right. We can't make it better. Right. Wh whatever your hand finds to do, <laughs> you know, do with all your might. Right. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do to the glory of right. God. We should be actually bringing the authority of Christ and His beauty into every single area of life because we're saved. Because He saved us by His grace. Yes. We're redeemed in Jesus yes. and we're reconciled right. to God. 
like the consequences of a wrong view of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't really have authority. He doesn't really have authority here or there or I don't really, I, that's outside of his realm of authority. Yeah. I don't need to speak to that issue. Right. Um, the consequence is also being of like current left behind movie and the, the books is, is um, you know, the, the worse it gets, the better for us. And we're getting out of here anyways. Um, the consequence being like I leave the world around me just to turn to flames. Like I can think of, of people in a movie theater watching a film about people getting snatched off the earth and the world being left for seven years of tribulation. I put popcorn in their mouths, you know, just super excited, like, you know, wishing themselves in the rapture, like, you know, at any moment. And, and they walk, I'm going to ask the question, if they walk out of that film, what are they thinking? What, when they walk and they see the world around them and they turn the news on that night, what's the difference in their thinking? And, and ours like they've watched that film now they go home they turn the news on we turn the news on they see what's going on we see what's going on what's their perspective they're looking for the Maranatha yeah exactly come quickly yeah, Lord exactly. and then what, what is somebody who believes that Christ is king he's seated now and he's putting his enemies, enemies under his feet what do we think when we see their news we gotta go okay how do I bring the gospel exactly. here how do I bring the gospel to this corner of darkness? How do we raise up people to, that are uniquely fit to bring the good news of salvation, forgiveness, redemption into this area? How do I put this under Jesus' feet? The church is God's bride. We're his help meet. And we're supposed to, as he takes dominion over the world with his kingdom, we're supposed to be his bride, his help meet, that actually joins him in that process in the world yeah. that's the story right. and are we able to do that with a warped and distorted view of eschatology that was unheard of right. <laughs> it, wasn't, it didn't come out of the mouth of a Christian right. before 200 years ago the whole left behind series yeah. kind of eschatology nobody thought that and has that been destructive for us oh yeah so where are we at today then? Are we waiting for Christ to establish his physical kingdom? Is his kingdom here and not yet? Or are we currently living in Christ's spiritual kingdom? This has far reaching implications beyond like, let's just have a popular eschatology. You know, let's be on, you be on my team. You know, you're on their team and let's have little battles. Yeah. Like here's the issue. Is Jesus king or no? Does he have all authority on earth now or no? Is, is his kingdom in history now really, like really here, actually? Back to the garden, God made fruit and the trees, and he said uh, they're beautiful and they're good for food. Mm -hmm. And then we see Jesus, who is the tree of life in the end, in, when, in the New Jerusalem, the tree of life is Jesus. Jesus is also beautiful and he's practical in time and space. What he, he actually lived in time and space. But I, I think this, this is more fundamental than a simple, like, which team are you on? Oh, yeah. This is like the whole story of the Bible, like, connected, like, put together. And it's, it, it, it's the expansive nature of this story that counts. Like, it's not just about my personal salvation. That's in there, yes, but it's about his kingdom. He's the king and he's getting all the nations and he's going to redeem all, all of this, all, all of this. People get reconciled to God and redeemed. That changes everything. So someone says, I don't know, Marcus, that God is concerned with here and now. Like he, he may not really be concerned with all, all this. The real punch is how, how concerned is God with his people and his world? He entered in it. He, yes. He, he, he took on right. flesh and, and he's a part of it. Right. Right. And, and so is he, is he concerned with redemption? Well, he, he, he tabernacled among us mm -hmm. to save us, right. touched us, ate with us, hung out with us. Right. So he cares <laughs> right. about what's going on. There's no, di there's no split where God goes, right. well, send enter so I... I could care less, let it right. rot, let right. it be destroyed. Even more so, the temple, the veil was ripped open and yeah. now God doesn't dwell in temples, he dwells among us. Yeah. 
as believers. Yeah. So essentially he's here all over the earth as the gospel goes forth now. Yeah. So where's the gold, Delium and Onyx, mm. right? Right. That, that's what we're to do. We're to yeah. beautify the new world. And Jesus says, behold, I'm making all things new. Right. Not I'm making all new things. I'm right. making all things new. Yes. Right. People's hearts are different in a culture. If they love God now and his laws are in their hearts, they don't want to kill the unborn. Right. They care about the widow and the orphan, right? Like who, who, put, who, who ends, who does the business of ending abortion in a state? It's the Christian church. Who does the business of ending the orphan problem in any state? Who is it? It's us. It's, it's, it's us. You know, who does the business of ending like homelessness and oppression? It's not the atheists. <laughs> like they're not going, let's go take care of the orphans, the widows, the homeless. It's the Christian church. And so what's the, what's the thing, the element that's missing? Us. Like us. And we start saying, well, like, what, why aren't we there? Well, you know, obviously there's, there's sin in the camp. But I think it's also like to thinking like, like this problem doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like it's, uh, it's not like well, Christians are disengaged. And that just, it just happens to be the case. Like they're disengaged for a reason. Like, it's because they think something, they believe something about the world, about Christ, about the gospel that leads to being disengaged. It leads them to, to not wanting to be part of this. And it's not to say that Christians, we don't do things. It's to say that there's something wrong. Are we telling the same story that Jesus told? Are we calling it the gospel of the kingdom? Who talks like that anymore? Are we, are we proclaiming what John the Baptist did, Jesus did, Paul did, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom? Because I believe with all my heart that that magnificent, magnificent story in Isaiah 2 about the high mountain and the nation streaming up to it, I believe that that's true and that it's happening now. Yeah. And I, I believe that the Great Commission is not, is not just wishful thinking. I think it's the goal. And I think it's going to happen. And, and I believe that Daniel 7 is true. That he's ascended. And that he's been given dominion. And, and, and I believe what Paul says about the story of history. That he is seated. He's reigning. He's putting his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is death. That's the final resurrection. But we're in that process of enemies being put under his feet. And he's going to, when he's done, deliver the kingdom. Not come and drop it, yeah. but give it to the Father, like, done. Here, here Father, yeah. your kingdom, it's done. Yeah. And, and, I, and I believe we have all the hope that God is powerful enough to do it, but it starts with us. It starts with us repenting, it starts with us abandoning indifference, and it starts with us getting our hands stinking dirty yeah. and going to fight for the good news of the kingdom. So will you speak to the culture, or will you allow it to go into further decay? Will you be the salt and light of the kingdom of God?